the culmination of a two-year project with the fashion house Mulberry. And Venetia is a filmmaker and photographer. She is British and we learned of her through the photo agency Seven, where she is one of the members. Seven is a um, organization of photojournalists internationally recognized. They're from all over the world. Um, their photojournalism is exceptional in that the quality of work that she and her colleagues do is incredible. Uh, just absolutely beautiful. When I have curated, this is my second show um, curating seven photographers and it's very challenging because they give you so much to pick from. Um, it's not easy. So um, what we're going to do, Venetia um, worked with Mulberry. She's going to give us some information about that, some more imagery from the book. She'll tell you more about her trajectory as a photographer. We're just thrilled to have her work. This is the first time it's um, this particular body of work is shown um, in the United States. And um, this book is one of her four books that she's published. Uh, two on England, Somerset, where she is from, and Glastonbury. And then she did her latest show, which was in New York, was on a book called Eight Days, which was a project she did coming to the United States, and it's a, a wonderful body of work. Um, we chose this particular piece of um, her career because we coincided our opening with Boston Fashion Week, and so it really dovetailed with that. So now I'm having this wild experience of trying to <laughs> talk to a group of people over a computer monitor, see myself talking to myself and see myself on the screen. So I now know where I need to look, but this is really disorienting, but it's very exciting to use this, um, this technology. And um, so live from London and much later uh, at night, here's Venetia. Hi. <laughs> can you see me? I don't know what you can see. Yes, yes. Good we evening, can. everybody. <laughs> this is an equally strange experience to me. I'm sitting in my in my sitting room in the middle of the night, <laughs> and all I can see is Seb, which is fabulous. <laughs> and I'm just laughing because I get it. It's um, it's great. I just would like before I start, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Seb who initiated this whole idea of showing my work in Boston. I can't tell you how much I would rather be with you all there this evening. I've never been to Boston, but Sib and I decided this was a great solution. Um, so well done us for embracing modern technology <laughs> and not getting on a plane. Mm. Um, and a big thank you to, to Eric and Christopher who have, um, well Christopher's very been very patient in helping me um, understand how to do this this week on a few trial runs. Um, so I'm glad the show looks great and I've brought tonight a few more images to show you from that project and some other work as well to, to show everybody. Um, I thought I'd start, um, Sib suggested I start talking a bit about my background as a photographer and how this project happened um, but please feel free at any point to ask any questions um, and we can we can take this in any direction people you know people want to go in. Um, so a little bit about myself and Mulberry. I uh, grew up in Somerset, which is a beautiful area in the southwest of England. And Mulberry's birthplace is also Somerset, and the factory where they make all of the the handbags and the leather goods is based in Somerset. And I have. I, I wanted to start really by showing you some of the, the first. Um, I think now I, I'd like to show you some images. I'm sorry. I might need screen share. This might take me a quick second. Um, okay, desktop. So, tell me, Sib, when you You're can start. So far, so good. I'm still seeing you. Christopher walked away. I'll grab him. We might need um, him back. Well, you're looking for the screen share. I did this. I did a test two nights ago, so I know exactly what you're doing in terms of trying to figure this out. Um, one of the other things I just want to tell everyone here and yourself is that we are also live. So we sent out the link, and this is something that people who couldn't get here can um, 
watch and be a part of live and we can also archive it. There you go, you're getting it um, so that people can go to it at another time. So we're really excited about that. Okay, so we're seeing it. Good. Can you see pictures? Yep. Okay. I, um, the reason I wanted to show you this project was that this was essentially the project that, that brought me to Mulberry and it's quite an amazing story. Basically, my, um, my background was very much in photojournalism and I completed a degree at London College of Printing, um, a postgrad in photojournalism in 1999 and I then spent a good five or six years traveling around the world trying to produce stories on issues that I cared strongly about and also in return receiving various assignments to, to keep me going back to those countries to do projects. But it was really in about 2003 that I came back to where I grew up, which was Somerset, and decided to turn my eye to documenting the place that I'd grown up. And at first, this really was just a way of me finding a balance between all the travels that I was doing but, and a way of keeping in touch with my family and my friends. But I very quickly discovered that this was much more uh, a way of working and a style of working that I really enjoy but also seem to be very well received and so this project really began and it started off as a very personal project and by 2007 I had a fairly substantial body of work and I went to Parry Photo which I'm sure some of you um, know about with a box of 7x5 prints in a little photo box really because somebody had invited me to go with them and I thought I'd go and check it out. When I got there, I was showing this little po sort of box of postcards to uh, quite a few people and one of the girls who I showed it to, she, she knew somebody who worked for a publisher in Germany and she said, you know, you really must come and show this work to my publisher, he'd really mm -hmm. love it. At this point, I've been working as a freelance photographer for nearly a decade, really working in the editorial field, doing a lot of NGO work abroad, and I hadn't even thought about publishing a book. It hadn't even occurred to me. This project, like I say, was really something that I could come back to, to being in the countryside, being with my family, being with my friends. But I thought, why not? So I went off to Germany to meet this publisher, and he said to me, I really love the work. Mm. Um, but it, in our company, you need to basically bring the funds to the table to get the book off the ground. And when I discovered how much it was, I was like, well, that's an amazing opportunity, but I, I don't have the funds, but thank you very much. And I went home. And about two months later, mm. I, uh, I don't know, I hope the quality is okay your end, because I can see it's not great on my computer, so I'll preview, but about two months later, um, I was doing um, a corporate job for Mulberry. I went in to photograph some of the CEOs and people that ran the company. It was a quick half day portrait job and I got chatting to Godfrey Davies who at the time was one, one of the, the head guys there and I was telling him about the Somerset project and I told him about my visit to the publisher in Germany and he invited me to present my work to Mulberry a, a few weeks later which I did. So mm -hmm. We're now into sort of a few, I, I'd, I'd met the publishers at the beginning of 2008, so this was March 2008, and within about a month, Mulberry had um, generously decided to support the publishing of the book. And by Paris Photo 2008, I was back in Paris with doing book signings. So it was an extraordinary fairy tale story of how, you know, a six or seven long term project, six or seven year project can suddenly become a book kind of overnight and I feel incredibly grateful for that happening. Years went on and Mulberry also decided to support the publishing of my second book called Glastonbury Another Stage which I'll come on to in a moment and this is essentially the roots of how my relationship with Mulberry evolved and essentially why at some point they invited me to shoot a two-year collaboration with them, which is the work that you see on the walls around you. But this is really lovely to show you this work, because this is Somerset. This is somewhere very, very close to my heart. Um, the book, Somerset Stories, Five Penny Dreams, is essentially just looking at the people around me and a way of life that they believed in. And I think it was really spurred on by the fact that 
uh, I remembered someone telling me years and years back how the hardest thing for a photographer was to photograph in your own backyard and I think that that had hung over me and I thought that's something I really need to challenge myself with and it became an amazing journey of discovery about an area that I love that I thought I knew and about the people who live there so this is a little snippet from that that body of work can I jump in and just it's like I want you to almost show them all again it's um, stunning what you capture and how because the, the composition and the light is amazing in every image and it's as if you're not there well that's great <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about anyone else, but that's it. like. like well, fast. these are people that I spent a lot of time. I'll flick through them slowly while we're talking about this project. But these, I mean, this this particular family are a family that are now still great friends of mine. But I spent a lot of time with them, and I think that whole sense of being so present in the situation that you're invisible is really, for me, the art of being a great photographer and one that I'm. I'm always learning and always practicing at mm. and sometimes you, you get it right but it's something that you're always that's one of the exciting things about being a photographer is that every situation you find and you have to navigate your way to that position very differently and I think it's one of the things I love I mean loving photography is one thing and being fascinated and curious about people is another so where, where, whether it's a a personal project and you're spending three days with a family or a portrait shoot and you have 30 seconds with someone it's the same skill base that you're using is to try and understand somebody and understand the relationship that immediately happens between you and that person and to try and get the best out of that person to make them feel the most comfortable um, you're reading so many things very quickly it's some a balance between art and psychology in a very strange way Mm. On the topic of light, um, I love the light in Somerset. And if anyone has seen the book, I wrote quite a lot about the rolling grey skies. It's a very soft, luminous light. Um, it's always quite cloudy. It rains quite a lot, <laughs> but you do get this incredible sunshine that um, that comes through, and it's a, it is an, it is an incredibly soft light. Um, this is. Another light of Somerset. When the light is good, it's golden and it's beautiful. And this is literally two fields away from where I grew up. And this is a place I go often. And uh, I don't know if anyone's read Tess of the Durbervilles. When I was growing up, this is totally how I imagined mm -hmm. Tess of the Durbervilles. Um, Somerset has a very beautiful personality. It has a great history very mystic history. This, this actually, where this view is, is on the Vale of Avalon, uh, which I'm sure many of you know the stories mm. of King Arthur, and mm. this is all apparently see. And actually, if you look slightly to the left of this view, the same view appears in my second book, Glastonbury and Other Stage, because you look over to Glastonbury Festival. So my first two books really were books that happened, you know, essentially on, on my doorstep. Um, I mean, this is a, a classic. Is, this um, is cider drinkers of Somerset, <laughs> and under their chairs they have their own big plastic gallons of cider. <laughs> <laughs> this is so indicative of you not being. You're so able to capture it without it being about you. Um, this is amazing. I was also thinking the the image with the boy and the pig behind him. Yes. Like I just keep thinking, all right, are you standing and waiting or are there many frames or are you capturing it? Because even just the way with the, the boy and the pig and the way the um, rake handle is at an angle and everything else is a vertical. I mean that these two men... I flick back their, to it. <laughs> so everyone can... There you go. Like look how that's just slightly off and his head and the pig's touching the wall. It's like... Is that out of many other images? You know I what I'm saying? Do you, or I did it just... I, I, no, I do hear what you're saying, and I do try and kind of tell people this. In that, you know, this was a five, well, six-year project. And when you do a six-year project, and I shot the whole thing on film, there are files of contact sheets. Mm. 
but you're selecting your best 50 or 60 images. Mm -hmm. Those decisions of selecting those images are based on a narrative for the book, but they're mm -hmm. also based on, you know, a, a sophisticated photography edit, which is based around certain things that I'm sure most of your audience with you tonight would, would under comprehend. You know, it's there are all those factors that you're that you're spotting, which some people might just, you know, not take take those details apart, but see see the whole. There are things that appeal to me that I, I edited this book with Klaus Carrer, my publisher. You know, it was a ruthless process. Many of my favorite images went by the wayside, and others made it in, and it was a fascinating learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, but I did learn a lot doing this project, and I'd like to say that really what I think happened for me is that after five or six years of working as a photojournalist and really n sort of nailing the kind of the art of not directing anything and really being totally invisible. I, this project was a stepping stone to understanding that you can like with Mikey for instance who you see here who I've known since he was three or four years old I would hang out with him on the farmyard but if I saw something that I felt was really working I might just say hey Mikey you know get his attention for a moment mm -hmm. and or we'd be chatting and I'd be taking pictures as we were chatting and I think that's what would have happened here and the great things about you know these kids is that I mean, the great thing about anyone is that you spend a long time with them is that a trusting relationship, mm -hmm. you know, evolves. So they, they trust me and I trust them and it was, it was great, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a great honor to be trusted by these people and it's an honor that I still hold. Every time I go to Somerset, I go see these kids, I'll take them cakes, we hang out, we do more pictures. They love it. Mm -hmm. And in return, what's been so wonderful is that when I've had commissions from magazines to do children's fashion shoots, I take it here. And we have had a blast at these guys, Italian <laughs> Marie Claire. We did a yeah. whole fashion shoot with these kids oh. and they loved it. The stylist yeah. turns up with seven suitcases of clothes. The girls think they're in heaven. They're mm. trying them all on and we're running around the farm. They're doing exactly what we would always do, but this time they're just wearing, you know, thousand dollar jackets, which they don't even <laughs> get. <laughs> And, you know, they think it's a lot of fun and it's great because the kids get some pocket money and the location gets a big chunk, which helps them go on. Everyone's happy. And I love, I love that reciprocal process. You know, mm -hmm. it's really important to me to kind of keep an eye out for that. So we've had a lot of fun with it too. Um, and on, on a journey level as a photographer, I think what is quite interesting, and, and as I think you, you've made it clear, you know, I, my commercial career really kicked off because of this book. Mm. Um, I still find that I sit down at an ad agency and an art director will sit down and he'll put this book on the table and go, this is what we want for this campaign. Mm. And it amazes me. Mm -hmm. And it goes on and on and on. And I think that the perhaps the fine line of like the reportage blended with just a tiny ingredient of gentle directing when you know what you want so mm -hmm. you can speed things up a little bit for everybody it is kind of where where this all kind of kind of get a harmonious whole that said i would say the majority of the images in this book are really moments i mean that's ellie baking biscuits these guys were making jam but you know chloe looked up and caught my eye kids having a bath and being running around all day so i mean really this, this, these guys, I met three kids in a field one day. We hung out for a while. And this was one of a few images of Tom that I just loved. It just worked. Mm -hmm. um, these guys, you know, I have to confess, I spent a few afternoons hanging out with these, <laughs> these old dudes, not drinking their cider because I would have been horizontal on the floor. But um, <laughs> it's a pretty potent, potent thing. But, you know, having a good time with them and chatting, and they get very relaxed. This is a his family is a great friend of mine, great friends of mine, and that was their new child. Um, so, yeah, most of this is really moments. I mean, Chloe answering the phone, teenagers hanging out by the river. There's many more in in, in the. Mm. We just pulled out a small edit. Um, so yeah. Beautiful. And, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just take you forward to um, a very different project 
but it's relevant to talk to sort of chronologically because this project I happened at Glastonbury which was that view that I just showed you at a, a great big music arts festival that happens every year in the midsummer of June. I started this project in about 2003. Again, it was a seven-year project, but it only happened for four days every year. A totally different project, but absolutely key to my training because I photographed about a thousand people every year during those four days. Mm -hmm. I had been going to that music festival since I was about four years old because I grew up right next to the site and the owner of the festival he granted me permission to set up a photo studio there mm -hmm. which I did in 2003 and the project grew and so did my team so going from just me in a teepee in the first year to by the seventh year we had a great studio and a digital bus and a team of 12 mm -hmm. these portraits um, happened and this was the project that um, I can see that's not great quality. Leonard Cohen, there's some amazing characters that we captured in this book. Mm. Um, Amadou and Mariam there, for those of you who know the singers, the great blind singers from Mali. Shirley Bassey, Paolo Nutini, so these are some of the performers. I love this project. This for me was a great opportunity to meet so many wonderful people and to and to do a classic portrait photography. Um, I really I really loved it, and the book is is great fun. And it was bought out in two thousand and ten, which was the same year that Mulberry was celebrating their fortieth anniversary. And Mulberry and Glastonbury are two of the big big sort of things to happen in Somerset. Glastonbury because it's the biggest music arts festival in Europe. It's been going on since this, since 1971, and over 200,000 people come every year. And Mulberry because um, it's 40 years of a great British band. So there was a great celebration. And when this book came out, Mulberry generously hosted a, a very big event in New York to celebrate it. So my my relationship with Mulberry was sort of well underway before they commissioned me to shoot their book for them and I have to say it, it in a very kind of a traditional manner it's an amazing thing for an artist to have the support of a brand or a name or someone such as Mulberry um, it's been it's been amazing for my career mm -hmm. and um, and I'm still working with them now on various projects so it's been great anyway these are just some fun shots from the Glastonbury book that I wanted to show because even though it's a studio project, I think that um, you know actually it's a, it's a lot harder when people are stepping out of a festival environment into a white sort of you know shining studio to make people feel completely at ease. Mm -hmm. But it was um, and a great thing about this project as well was that it um, it was my solo show at the National Portrait Gallery in London, so that was also mm -hmm. an incredible mm -hmm. opportunity. And this image here is the same valley that I showed you before from the Somerset book, but like I said, looking the other way. Mm -hmm. And that whole view that you see there is the Vale of Avalon that goes down towards Glastonbury Tour, and this is, this is the, the festival site. So it's, it's really very beautiful. Mm. Um, so those, those are the introduction to those two books. And then um, I have brought you a slightly wider edit not a completely complete edit, but um, of the Mulberry book. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm working off my desktop here. I hope the quality is okay. Yeah, yeah. Shall I, shall I flick through some of these, Sib, or does people yep. have some questions before we move on? I, I just have to think of a question which yep. you partially answered. Um, the first place she was showing, I guess it was film, and she said it was film. I wonder what kind of format is she shooting in? Um, can you talk a little bit about the format that you were shooting with in the, um, uh, Somerset, the Somerset project? You know, the Somerset book was a real, that someone said something brilliant to me. When I started doing that project, I, I got myself into a panic about whether I should be shooting in black and white or in color or 35 mil or 6x. I shot so many different formats over the mm -hmm. seven years of that book because 
naturally I was a photographer experimenting. I shot with 6.6, six, I shot with 6.45, I shot with 6.7, I shot with 35 mil. I did shoot all of that project on film, but I really was mixing around because naturally over seven years I was buying and selling different cameras and borrowing cameras and experimenting. Um, but I, the majority of that project is medium format, so it will be 6.6, six, 6.45 or 6.7. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one question? Yeah. On the indoor uh, shots, they're just almost so perfect that uh, do you use any artificial light or is everything just a high speed lens and available light? Did you hear that or should I? Yes, repeat? neither. I mean, I don't use any. In the Somerset book, there was no artificial light, hmm. uh, not even a high speed lens. I mean, I, you know, I seem I shoot on you know, four hundred ISO. I mean, it was fine. I think Old we're all gonna have, we're all gonna get on a plane and go shoot in Somerset. It's really <laughs> well. I keep. I, well, this is this is a. Oh well. Anyway, we'll come on to my America project afterwards. It's it's just gorgeous. Um, the, yep, it, the, hold on, it, sorry, Venetia. One another question. Yeah. Yep. I read a little bit of her bio. And she said she she's a anthropologist by training. I was wondering if she can make a comment about uh, how that how well. First of all, to be an anthropologist in your own hometown takes some doing. And is there any any points in being an anthropologist that she can share with us? Uh, did you get that? Sib, I didn't quite get that with the phone. That's actually. fine. Um, it was a question about your background as an anthropologist and how you utilize those skills in exploring your own hometown and how just uh, he was asking for you to speak to the um, where do you think the um, anthropological training informs your photographing? I think the relationship between my the anthropology and the photography is is absolutely key to to what I do. Mm -hmm. I I went to Edinburgh to study anthropology. Um, I feel like I'm still studying anthropology. Mm -hmm. I, I I mean my anthropology is is you know quite a complicated topic, and there are different. It's it's devised through theory and um, and experience, and there's there's, there's so much in the study process that actually I was less interested in and I think in a way I, I remember actually the day that I walked into the library and I saw a book that said photography and anthropology and I thought my god that's amazing you know <laughs> actually, I, I was like the two go together but yes I mean anthropology is you know essentially a study of people a study of cultures and and I think in the same way you have to be Studying and looking at yourself and how you um, how how you are present with other people. So yes, it, they are. It's absolutely linked. And I think you know the camera at first was. I mean, I was traveling all over Africa for six or seven years, and I think you know it's it's a fact, isn't it? A camera is a great tool to to meet people and to go to places somehow. So. It becomes it's a conversation in itself. Every time I, you know, even here, people love to look and talk about what camera you have and what you use. It's it kicks off conversation. It's um, mm -hmm. it's key for me as well that the camera is that and it's not a barrier. Um, I mean, not to divert too much from this, but I was recently doing a film in Mali that I was shooting myself on an SLR for uh, Medicines on Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, through Seven. Mm -hmm. And I decided to buy one of those big shoulder braces knowing that I'd be filming all day and I thought I would be taking a lot of the pressure out of all the kind of weight off my arms and putting it on my shoulder. But, you know, it was just another thing between me and my subject matter. It was another piece of equipment and I tried to work very minimally. I tried to have very little kit that I have to put up in front of my face because you feel it, people feel it. When the eye contact goes, you feel it. So you have to work around, like quite often I might even shoot with the camera off to the side of me if I've set something up, just whatever you, whatever it takes to keep the dialogue and, and you know, a momentum between you and the subject matter. 
Mm. And um, and actually, when I work on big commercial shoots, I try to keep quite a closed set. I try to keep it all very minimal, as as you know, as much as you can. So sorry, I don't know if that totally answered your question, but um, we might swing yeah. back to it another layer. We'll see. But I got a nod. <laughs> <laughs> I'll flick through these now mm -hmm. just because I think it gives everybody um, a little bit more of the life sort of that went on. I know you've got about 12, is it, Sib images up yep. at the gallery? But essentially what happened, this project, there wasn't a, a brief at the beginning. Um, Mulberry asked me to, if I, if I would like to shoot something for their 40th anniversary project. And at the time, I don't think they were entirely sure what kind of a project they were, what kind of a book they wanted to produce. And they invited me to sort of go along to lots of events with them, like Fashion Week events. This is at Fashion Week in New York. The corporate forum, partner forums, where you know, everyone would get together for a weekend to visit the factory in Somerset, the offices in London. Some of the parties they threw, that's Florence and Florence wow. and Machine. Mm -hmm. And it would really be that some of the girls um, who work at Mulberry out in a shop, day shopping in, in New York. And it really was just like every few months they'd sit down and they'd ping a, put a few dates in my diary. And I was like, right, we'll keep that free, we'll keep that free. And after each shoot, I'd get together, I'd do an edit, a wide edit, and I'd get together with the ladies who were art directing it. The, one of the prime um, directors and designers is George Georgia Fendley, and we'd sort of look at the pictures and see how it was shaping up, see what we liked, see what we didn't like, and slowly the project took shape, and it was great. It was a really fun, you know, they I became really part of the team, um, and I mean this this I mean this is themed so random, but this was Mulberry took their whole company to the circus. <laughs> um, this was everyone queuing up for, for sandwiches afterwards. I love this shot actually. This was shot out of uh, the window of the hotel that I was staying in in New York. They always used to put me up in the Maritime Hotel. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. knows that, but it's got these fabulous round windows that mm -hmm. I love. <laughs> and um, and I love that that shot. I'm very glad mm -hmm. it made it in. Um, so I know Sib wanted to have this one up at the show. <laughs> I, <laughs> I vetoed it. Yep. Totally yep. my fault. So that's why I had to put it in tonight. There you go. Thanks. Um, here's a dog. He's great. Um, that is Alexa Chung, who was one of the ambassadors of Mulberry. The, the, the famous Alexa bag was obviously named after her. Um, models asleep. You see a lot of that. Having, having a fag outside of so house in the snow in the freezing cold New York winter. Um, so it was really fun because I was really trying to capture the incredible work that goes into putting on all the events such as Fashion Week and the characters behind it. Um, and we've all seen a lot of images from, from backstage shows because obviously it's something that's very well documented and I think I tried to, I wanted to bring something new to it. I wanted it to be personal to Mulberry. Mulberry are um, renowned, they're incredibly friendly and it's very, it's very, um, very open and when they have their parties it's kind of burgers and chips and it's not kind of fancy frilly, it's very, it's, it's a very sort of, um, if they have a very British um, reputation, I'm, I'm quite difficult to say, but I wanted to shoot the project so it fitted the Mulberry brand and keep it very smiley and happy and friendly. So mm -hmm. um, that's quite random. That's some. You know, I actually I had that was in my first edit. Which one? I, that uh, one. Yeah, I just love that image. Yeah, but that it was, was in New York. Yeah. Yeah. And this, I, I can't. Every person that walks in, we have that in a very prominent place, and it's also the largest image in the show. And everyone refers to it as Adele. And it yeah, does. It was a good hair. It was a good yeah. hair, that one. Yeah. I know. Look, Adele esque. Yeah, I love that one too. Beautiful. So. Yeah. <laughs> Fun to see ones that we considered because that one was in 
a first edit too. I know, I know. With <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to cut something down, yeah. you know. And the amazing thing was that when Mulberry put this book together, they actually made it, as you've seen, a completely a photographic book. It didn't have the most of the content of the text it was meant to have. So loads of the images made it, which was great. Yeah. Um, but it's difficult sometimes, you know, with these books to break down the images, to, you know, to show only 15, 16. It's difficult to kind of represent the whole book. Mm -hmm. But for anybody who has been backstage at Fashion Week, it is, it's, it's a wonderful thing to photograph. You've got all these incredible looking people, all very either exceptionally busy or exceptionally bored. And there's all these scenes going on and there's sort of, you know, panics. And you just have to float around and be, you know, like I say, very invisible. Um, and not get it in the way. This is actually a, um, a, a, a great Australian model who I had lots of fun with. Um, it was hard to choose already. between that and the image before. We have this one in the show, but yeah. that's a great image as well. No, I was. Um, she she was great. I love that one of her there too. I mean, this is scenes that I'm sure you know. We've all seen. We've seen lots of. Girls hanging around between the hair and makeup sessions, and the chaos between mm. the shows and the parties. You know, Mulberry throw incredible parties. So these are all the girls at the parties. This is outside Claridge's, um, where Mulberry have thrown their fashion parties for a few years in a row. Mm -hmm. Some of the party goers, and this is in the factory, and details in the factory. And I think that's what's great about Mulberry is they wanted to celebrate their brand, you know, not just looking at the models, but looking at all the heroes who, who make all of the products as well and the landscape that is Somerset. And they've got a good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's back to the beginning, anyway, kind of, isn't it? A bit of New yeah. York. That's yep. a very tired Mulberry worker. I love the, I love that one too. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions about the book? Anyone have any questions about the book or the Mulberry work? Otherwise, I can move on to. Yep. I have a question which is not uh, at all to do with photography because I know very little. Is, is uh, Somerset, a, uh, what economic status would it be around there? Very varied. Somerset's, um, I mean, the, 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 the main sort of one of the largest towns in Somerset is Bristol, which is in a very industrial city. But the economics have changed radically over the past 30 years, and this is much what my project was about. Essentially, Somerset, you know, is a very bohemian, mystical background. It's outside the Green Belt of London. It's a two and a half, three hour drive from the city, so it hasn't been affected by the commuters. But since the 80s, the whole uh, sort of second homeowner, homeowner, rush began and obviously prices have soared, house prices in Somerset. And the, what's happened is that some of the, the, the kind of the Somerset locals have, have been very sort of marginalized and unable to get onto the property market. But also it's meant that communities have changed, villages that used to be really kind of thriving obviously now are, are part, partly empty during the weeks. But this is a story that I think is replicated across Europe and perhaps in America itself. So this was also one of the things that I was looking at when I was there. And essentially what took me to focusing on the people that I felt were striving to live a way of life that they believed in and people who were going out of their way to stay true to that. And I'm talking about people who wanted to, had chosen to live in the countryside wanted to grow their own vegetables or produce their own meat or simply wanted their children to grow up in nature. And one of the things that's quite key about this book is that, it, as you've probably seen from the project, there are many people who don't live, you know, in, in, in sort of normal houses, people are living outdoors, 
horse-drawn people who are living under canvas and led by horses in, in caravans. They're not gypsies. They are the, all the people in the book are people who are living and working on the land, but they are itinerant workers. Somerset has, you know, produces all sorts of crops. Right now it's the time for the apple harvest. And so people would traditionally come to Somerset looking for work. And I chose to focus on that. That was something that I was interested in. And to look at that and to look at the changing face of Somerset. And actually, some of the people who I, I spent time with and photographed who were then horse-drawn have now given up and are now living in houses. And I say given up because it was just too much of a trial. It was a hard lifestyle. The land is all owned. There is very little free land there. There used to be pastures and verges that were accessible for people to park and live and work locally for farmers. Some people are lucky to find a farmer who might invite them to live on the land in return for work. But these opportunities became scarcer and scarcer. And so the economics in Somerset are, are really very, very varied from you know, incredibly um, wealthy people who are enjoying all the pleasures of country, countryside lifestyle to much less privileged people. Um, Kate and Simon from Dreamers Farm, who is one of the families I focused on, and the parents of Mikey, who we just saw with the pig, they're both traditional farmers from Somerset, and they're doing what they know best, living a way of life they believe in, rearing rare breeds, selling flowers, selling vegetables, and whilst they have not a penny to rub between them, they do sit down and all the food on their plate most of the days is theirs. Mm -hmm. But they're up against it, they're struggling, and I think this, this sense of struggle was something that really inspired me. It's something that inspires me about all of humanity, is people, how every day getting up and facing life can be difficult for people on whatever level. So that was something I focused on. Mm -hmm. Oh, another, yep. What's the idea behind all these wigs? Oh, going back to Mulberry, what's the idea behind all these wigs? At Fashion Week, every time they do a fashion show, there is a certain theme. So you, this year must have been, you know, the, the kind of 60s beehive rock and roll theme. And then you had another year was where everyone had the red hair. It's just a theme. That's how um, different... I mean, I have, to, I have to be frank with you, my background is not in fashion, so I excuse the language, but they do have a different sort of a theme that the clothes and, and that collection is inspired by and is, and is therefore called. So that's, that's what this particular year was that. Um, as a uh, wardrobe stylist, I can speak to that in that the, um, if you're working on an editorial or a show, there is layering by the creative team and the hair and makeup is very detailed. It is worked out before. I mean, there might be something that happens serendipitously, but um, there's a lot of talent going into taking whatever is the story and the narrative behind that particular collection and really pushing it. Um, so you saw there's the one where it was crimped hair and then everyone had the crimped hair and then the red wigs. Um, it's a way to really, um, when you're, especially on the runway, you're doing something extravagant and memorable and dramatic. Um, it basically um, supports the, the clothing. Yep. Um, can, can you and I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh-huh. 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 U
you and I could just talk a little bit about coming up with 12 images when we have hundreds to choose from. And he was reflecting that a friend of his who's a filmmaker said um, that it's the worst thing that could happen is him editing his own film and that photographers usually edit their work. And so it's really kind of an open-ended question about the editing process. Yeah, I think that editing is, I mean, it's absolutely key. Learning how to edit your own work only, I think, makes you better at what you do. But you do have to take a certain distance from your work. And I, I think that the best edits are done in collaboration with somebody else. Um, this project, specifically, I shot on digital. And after each time I did a trip, there was thousands and thousands of images. And what I would do, would I would share all of the images that I was happy with, which was pretty much anything, but unless it, it was, you know, something that had fallen out of focus and it wasn't meant to be out of focus or something like that, with the, with um, the design company who were working very closely with Mulberry. And I allowed them to sort of take the reins with the edit, but, I mean, to put it in perspective, I'd just done two books in under two years and I was doing back-to-back -back commercial work at the time and I was shooting this and a whole bunch of other stuff and it was a time in my career where I mean you know I was sleeping on my studio floor most evenings and so for somebody to take over the editing process was just a welcome relief <laughs> and I, I didn't have an issue it was very much Mulberry's project it was great to be involved in it I was delighted to be shooting stuff and I wouldn't it was nothing that I that I kind of I wasn't worried about the relationship. We already had great trust, it, you know, in doing various work together before. So obviously they they were very kind and asked my approval every step of the way of their final edits on different chapters. But I was really fine with it, and I was excited to see also what somebody else came up with. It, that's always quite interesting, and I I was quite excited. Um, I just, there's some pictures in here that. I felt Mulberry were, um, were very brave with their edit. There are some images um, that, there's one particular one that I just thought that's, oh, I haven't got them all up now. But I thought that, um, yeah, I was interested, like the moments that they chose, I, I liked the feel of it. So, um, but it is, editing is an incredibly time consuming process but it's um, absolutely integral to you know to, to looking at your work and understanding it and knowing what you're saying and the hardest thing is is doing a book because you have to be really selective and then it's even harder when it comes down to doing something like a show for this particular show Sib um, I, I had I mean when you've worked with a project for a long time you kind of know what your favorite pictures are and I had quite a clear idea about what I wanted to show um, in Boston, and Sib had um, was was brilliant actually because she did. I mean, she she had a few edits, and I and I asked her to make some tweaks, and she generously did, which was great. Um, so you know, it was just great to be happy for us both to be happy with what was being shown. But I think I mean, Sib, I don't know. I mean, you in a way you had a lot to choose from, didn't you? So maybe it was hard at your end. I don't know. I actually took a photograph of the book once because I had so many pink stickies coming out of it. It was hilarious. I, I, I was going to blog about it. Um, what, what I found really interesting was, as you had mentioned before, when you have so many images to choose from, picking um, your narrative is really what was challenging. There could be many, many narratives from the same body of work. And when you mentioned, Venetia, that you think that the um, strongest comes out of a collaboration, I feel like the places where you and I went with, mm, well, I like this, and mm, I don't like that, and you and I had to look at it again, I feel made it stronger and that that is part of the process. Um, and it's interesting, um, often when I'm curating a show, I am looking at a person's work from such a different perspective. And I have sat with photographers going through hundreds of images, and it's 
it's interesting. I think as a curator, I feel I am another layer of telling a story. And so the photographer is told a story, and then sometimes seeing the work, like the broad brush of work, you see a different story. And it's a very interesting process. I actually love it. I, uh, my favorite part is the working with photographers and going through that process, I think, is is just wonderful. Uh, when I did the seven show that just came down, it was called I See. I worked with 19 of the seven photographers, and each person sent me um, uh, upwards of 10 images or so and as I mentioned they are such highly qualified photographers it was like how can you say no to anything and I had to wrangle it down and when we had 19 people sign up I said okay let's cap it at five and so I had to figure out five and I had to pull from their narratives as well and one photographer who I've now become um, good friends with this is Peter um, uh, you know, I'm working with people I've never met before. Sometimes it, English isn't their first language either. And because of seven, I'm getting hilarious emails like, I'm on the Baltic Sea. I can talk between two and nine. And I'm in the Congo. And it was just, they were everywhere. Um, but Peter contacted me and, and he said, really? You're going to drop this? That's my, that's my favorite image. That's my most sold image. And and um, and we didn't put it in the show, and it's not it's not easy because you're coming from from different places. Um, but I was so excited when this show came together because I love that we have um, black and white and color, and I love that we have behind the stage and and then just like some of those pensive moments. Like, I love asking people when I'm in the gallery what their favorite is, and it's always different. And we had a class here last week from a college, and we must have had 20 students, and they were all over this. They were just really, really excited, and no two picked out the same picture. And I thought that was so telling. I really loved that. Mm -hmm. And that different things speak to different people, and I think if you make a good show, that's the way it should be. Yeah. There's also an art, actually, with, I'm, I'm sure you go through this, um, as a, in my background, I, I've done wardrobe styling and art directing and creative directing on photo shoots, and um, I used to kiddingly say many years ago I could have a book and call it The Cutting Room Floor, because there are many images that I was involved in and loved, and they didn't make it for whatever reason, and the placement of images next to each other when you're doing something that's going to be in a magazine or a book is a whole other art and frankly when you're hanging a show there's an art to that as well in terms of the the balance um, I think I think it's quite important that I mean I, I agree with you Sib like you know everybody's gonna have a different a different favor a different viewpoint a different perspective which is why you have to be careful with editing, because if you ask too many people's opinions, it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. But I love, you know, often like we've just been, I'm about, my new website's about to be relaunched in a few weeks, and I love, I've got one um, quite new assistant. She's, uh, she's really young and quite, hasn't had a lot of experience, but I, I absolutely love her, what she sees. And I've been sitting editing, doing you know, some of the portfolios, and I love that, you know, the mm -hmm. fresh eye and kind of bouncing things around. So. I think it's really important to, to sort of share, but I think at the end of the day, you have to, you essentially have to know because you, you can only be the author of your own work. So sometimes you have to be quite hard to, it's, and I think it's very difficult to, to make decisions. The whole, where well, you're talking about the, the gentleman who asked the question, mm -hmm. the whole thing about your friend being a filmmaker and not editing, I think actually I've discovered that's a very American thing it, over here people edit do all their own editing themselves and when I came back from Mali I had to just send all my footage over to America and it was incredible I was like wow I don't have to do any of this <laughs> and on one one level I was like god you know surely I need to sort of write lots of notes on another level I thought god that's amazing you know mm. to sort of gift it over and let just other people take from it what they want so I think there's diff different ways I don't know if you guys are interested I mean I know we're slightly 
running out of time or coming to the end of it, but I have brought a bit of a snippet from um, a recent, um, my, my most recent book called Eight mm -hmm. Days, mm -hmm. which just, I mean, I just wanted to show this because um, <laughs> I kind of got a little bit like everybody thought I was shooting children in muddy fields in cloudy Somerset, and I think after the after the Mulberry book, and anyway, I decided I wanted to go and shoot in the Californian night and see, <laughs> try my hand at that. So that's when I I went off to um, to California with some friends on a road trip. It was never meant to be a book. It was called <laughs> Eight Days as a result because I couldn't think of any other fitting title that was more truthful because it really was just an eight day road trip. And I went with some friends, and we drove up through um, through the deserts and to Burning Man Festival, and then back through Yosemite and Joshua Tree. And I really wanted to look at the whole concept of the American road trip. I felt that it was um, something that we've all read, heard, seen about since um, well, for centuries. And yet, it still seems to bring people who are kind of exploring a sense of freedom. It's a magnet for people who think that they're escaping everything and going on this adventure. And it allured me and some friends, and I was interested in how a land so timeless can constantly draw people to it to imprint their own new experiences and their own memories on it. And uh, so I was looking at this, and this is really just a few shots. Because of the timelessness, I shot some of it on Polaroids. I actually decided I wanted to take all the cameras that hadn't seen the light of day in a big Pelican case and take them on a trip, which is exactly what I did. So this is one of my very old Polaroid cameras. I, this was on uh, black and white film. And they're not actually in the order. I don't think that they are in the book. So, um, But anyway, life on the road and people were just getting away from everything for a bit. I don't know how many cameras you brought, but you could have called it the number of cameras as well. I know. <laughs> and you know, it's amazing that I had any cameras because we hired one of these RVs and I, um, I, I decided to put, luckily I was insanely organized. I think it was actually to do with a guy called Zach who came with us as a sort of driver and occasions guy. We put everything in zip bags and then we put all the cameras in what was the shower zone of the RV thinking, well that's great, we'll have outdoor showers and we'll make sure that this shower zone is protected only from the camera kit. That way it would be safe. To wake up on the first morning to find everything floating in about four inches of water. Oh. So it was amazing that anything survived. So yeah. Grateful wow. for the zip bags. Um, so anyway, these are just some moments. And Yosemite, which was for me, it was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a mecca. I mean, this is the world of Ansel Adams. I had to go there, so it was amazing for me. I, I didn't spend long enough there, um, but no, it was a great trip. That's Yosemite as well. Mm. I have a picture not dissimilar to this um, that I wake up to every single morning. It's, it's in my bedroom, and I love it because it just it reminds me on these gray, wintry days just to see the light hit the mountains, to see the reflections, to know that space. I just find it keeps me going. You know, it's really inspiring. Mm. That's in Joshua Tree. Back on the road. So anyway, there's a that's a few images from a project called Eight Days. So fun! It looks like a question. Yeah. Denisha, uh, you know the audience here is eclectic, uh, from voyeurs to admirers, but uh, I'm sitting next to actually self-serving next to my daughter who's 20, and aspiring photojournalist, and I'm just wondering, uh, in, in other interviews we've had or talked with, where you are isn't as easily accessible today as it was a dozen years ago it started, and I just wonder if you have any inspirational advice on 
how to, you know. Yeah, I'm no, I'm I'm hearing you. you know, Tomorrow, everybody, here, everybody here has two jobs, and the successful photojournalists really have one. And I'm, you know, I just would be interested in your comments. I think that um, I when I when I went to London College of Printing, I was twenty four, twenty three. And most of the people on my course that year, the postgraduate course of photojournalism, had significant experience in photography. They'd either been working for their local newspaper in their hometown, or they'd been teaching photography. Um, Marcus Bleasdale, who is also a member of Seven, he was also on that course, but um, he he was much more worldly than I was. I mean, I grew up in Somerset, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I came, I went to Edinburgh to do my studies, and I travelled a bit, but. I remember on the first day our tutor sitting down saying, you know, there's no future in this. There's definitely no money in it and you're not going to get famous. And I think half thinking that some of us would just walk out the door and everyone was like, yeah, okay, so what's next? You know, like people sitting in that room were not sitting in that room, you know, for a success that meant um, a financial success or, you know, a fame success. And it was really hard. And I, and I, I think one of the reasons that I really always like I, I like talking to people, especially people who are starting off, is that you know I, I am not I have no kind nothing to hide of like the sweat, blood, and tears of my first ten years, and it's an incredibly difficult journey. It's totally dependent on self belief because for a long time nobody really gets what you're doing, especially your family and friends are like you know you never have any money, you're always away, and no one really sees much of your work published and. It's incredibly difficult, and I can't imagine that it's any easier today at all. The only thing that perhaps has changed significantly is I, I'm very grateful that my my training was on slide film. You know, I was I was I assisted a National Geographic photographer in Washington, and the reason I say that is that I, I feel today that some people have not focused enough on the technique of photography and enjoyed that enough. It's like everyone wants to jump steps. But I think what people forget is that photography is a medium, it's an art form, and that needs to be mastered. And then what you say also has to come with it. And because of the, you know, the sort of incredibly quick kind of, you know, the digital revolution, a lot of more people have cameras. I guess the market's a lot more competitive. But I don't think it is any harder, and my advice would be, if that's what you really want, then then stick with it and go for it. I just think that um, being tutored by the right people is is key, and I think that the earlier you can make a decision about what direction you want to go in, the better, because then you can seek, you know, the right guidance. I feel that I hung in there for just love of what I was doing, tenacity, and then after a certain number of years, fear, because I hadn't, didn't know where else to go with it, didn't have any other skills. But, you know, I, I sort of believe and I wonder whether there's a theory that if you just keep going at something, eventually it does take off, you know, and for there was many years where I was working, I say as a photographer, but you know, I looked at my account at the end of the year and it didn't say that I was working as a photographer and I I couldn't believe how I just kept myself going and I and I wasn't somebody with um who had external help at all. And I say that because I very much did this on my own. It wasn't like, you know, I, I know some you know, I, I my kickoff was that you know, my grandmother gave me when I when she died, she left me some money that helped me buy my first camera and lenses and then that was kind of it. So when I say, you know, sweat, blood and tears, it is really, really hard. It's a really hard thing to do. But I think the hardest thing is kind of keeping going at the hardest moments. And I think that I remember specifically turning 30 and thinking, I really need to go get a job. This is a joke. Who can I keep on kidding? And feeling like I was at breaking point and probably feeling like I'd been there for a while. And then the Somerset Project got picked up by Art and Commerce and... It was uh, credited among the peak awards of emerging talent, mm -hmm. and that was in 2007. And I, that was a great. I mean, in those, 
you know, in, in those times, any up and any open door is just a miracle because you get so many no's and you get so many kind of rejections. Just trying to get people to see your work can be hard enough. And that was an incredible thing that happened to me. And then I had the incident happening of going to Paris with, with a box of images. And I mean, at this time, I could hardly even afford a train ticket to Paris, but I still believed in that ethic of keep saying yes to everything. Keep saying yes to all the opportunities. Keep going, keep going. And then the book happened. And then in 2008, I was approached by Marco Santucci, who is still my commercial representative in London, to join his agency. And that radically changed my life because he brought me the work that I was then be able to put everything into balance. And I had the funds to then go off and focus on my personal projects. So in about two or three years, everything went like flipped completely from being, you know, literally every single day wondering what was going to happen next and living into a state of anxiety to just having a little bit more stability in my life. And only, I mean, you know, I'm now, I've just turned 37 and last night I, I only brought a, I only had, I've only had a home for a year and last night I sat in a room, I'm, I'm in the middle of putting a film script together and I set up an easel and I actually laughed at myself thinking I can't believe I finally got this in my life, somewhere where I can paint and cut out ideas and be creative and it is a lifestyle, that's what I would say, it is a lifestyle and it is a journey, I mean you have to be prepared to be quite hobo for a while if financially that's what gives and say yes to everything and go everywhere but that kind of comes naturally if it's something that you really want you know and two days ago I came off a commercial job that I've been shooting for a long time which has been incredible and I was literally sitting having a cup of tea with the hair and makeup girl in my kitchen and I got a call from the Telegraph magazine which is a weekly magazine in London you know, asking if I would go with them to the Amazon to do a story for them in, in November. Mm. And I was like, brilliant, you know. But I remember 10 years ago, I'd go and see that magazine, you know, so often before I got any work for them. Things do come around. Like, I just mm. think you have to stick with it. And you have to love what you're doing because if you don't love it, there's not many rewards for, you know, in it at all. It's it, it's the lifestyle of, of it, really, that is the rewarding thing. And you know, just to wrap that up, I for me, this is a lifestyle. You know, I'd do it all over again to be having this lifestyle. I've been all over the world. I've met so many extraordinary people. I'm always learning. And it, I feel very alive with that. So even though there have been moments where, you know, I pulled my hair out and just couldn't believe, you know, just the stress has been extraordinary. I look back and I, I would do it all over again because, you know, you have to choose how you want to live your life. This has been incredible. So, yeah, I hope that's answered your question or at least inspired, but, um, yeah. I'm getting a thumbs up <laughs> and a yes. Um, I, um, I know it's very late for you. And <laughs> but then you see, it's fine. I mean, this is the funny thing is that, you know, it is 1.30 and I know I have to be up in about five hours, but, you know, it's actually, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to talk to, to people um, and try and share some of this because that is a great question to ask. You know, I think it's an, a lot of what doesn't get talked about, actually, I think. Mm -hmm. And people think, think, look at you and they go, oh, you're so successful here and there, but it doesn't just happen. And, um, you know, it really is a journey. So my, my advice, just the final advice is just start, if there's anything I regret the most, is worrying so much between the ages of 20 and 30 was all the worrying. I wish I'd just lived it and done it as I did and to see where it took me, you know, because the worry doesn't change anything at all. Mm. Anyway, Sib, over to you. Well, um, two thoughts. One is just when you were, um, when you were mentioning about um, when someone's learning, I when I went the first year that we had digital silver imaging, I was at Photo Plus where Eric is now, and it was amazing seeing the response of the people that came to our booth. And there's just thousands upon thousands of people that come to this show, and I um, PDN is who sponsors it, and I said to them, just come stand by our booth, because people who have a traditional photographic background, and we're seeing silver gelatin prints, which is what 
we're able to make from digital files would literally stop, just stop and look and, and be almost they, like they were seeing a friend. They were just like, oh, is that a silver gelatin print? And then people who were coming to photography only through the digital experience we're like, those are really cool prints, or those are really nice, but it, it didn't have that um, almost visceral reaction and the, the hand of what it's like. So um, I underscore what you said about knowing that aspect of photography, like the tangible, uh, really the wonder of it um, coming from your vision through the camera onto the paper and then putting it in chemistry that you watch it come up. Um, and we talk about it here that it really isn't completing the process until it's actually being shown uh, and printed. That um, we see a lot of things on screen and it's different than something that's actually printed. Um, it's an exciting time to be a photographer and I really appreciate um, so many of your insights and your ability to talk about your work um, from from such a really beautiful place, it's very organic and and real. And then the beauty of your work just reinforces it. I mean, really, much of it is uh, is breathtaking. So we're Thank glad you. you kept going, and I'm I'm sorry you worried. <laughs> I, I still keep going. Well, no, no, I mean it wasn't like worried, but I say that because I, I was just thinking of I don't know the girl in the audience, the daughter, but I'm at twenty. How I would be at twenty now, you know? It's um, I think. You know, just just go for it. Just 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 go for it and give it your best shot. You know, and love it and work hard at it. Everything takes hard work. Yeah, so. and it's just that part about the. Um, I mean, that is the whole irony of life. If you knew then what you know now, and you can't. So the no, precisely because it is a journey. I mean, you know, I'm still learning now, and what I know in five years' time, I don't know now. I mean, that's the incredible thing about it, isn't it, for us all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask, is there any other last question? Just thank you for this wonderful visit. Did you hear that? Thank you for this wonderful visit. Was oh. back. And really, really, I wish we all had a cup of tea. It was lovely. <laughs> I, know to, um, I know. I was going to just say a little, I wonder how I there go back. You go. The... You're back. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm Not back. Me. Yay. There you go. Stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you enjoy the show, and, and thank you mostly to Sib for, um, for this fantastic evening. Um, and, yeah. Great. Well, I hope you get some good sleep, and thank you so much. And, actually, we can post this because Christopher can give us the specifics, but people can go to the talk. Okay. So we'll have to do that. Amazing. Great. Thank Great. you. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.